This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. All right, halfway through the month of May. So glad you tuned in for another Farm Monitor. As the man said, I am Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Yes, time flies and so does the show once we get rolling. Straight ahead, it's not every day the governor stops by Georgia Farm Bureau, but this was not your average visit. Find out what prompted some of the state's top ag leaders to attend this special occasion. It's a growing problem in the ag industry. Farmers and ranchers struggling with stress and mental health. But don't despair, there is now a directory of resources geared specifically towards that group. Plus, in 2019, Washington Farms said goodbye to strawberries, ending a 26-year tradition. But to the delight of an entire community, they are now back and better than ever. Ray sits down with owners John and Donna Washington on why the change of heart and if the change is permanent. These stories and so much more start right now on the Farm Monitor. With an overall impact of more than $36 billion to its economy, Georgia is considered the number one forestry state in the entire country. And a big reason for that is timber being used for more than just construction projects. Devin Jones takes a look at one operation in Emanuel County that uses every piece of the tree from pulp to bark. The process of turning trees into usable lumber on a large scale takes plenty of manpower and machinery. And one of the biggest sawmills in the state is right here at Faircloth Forest Products, a family-run operation with humble beginnings. My son got out of school and went to work with me, and one day we just decided we'd put a small mill up of our own and try it. And uh, it was very successful, and uh, we tried that for a few years, and uh, opportunity come by later on that encouraged us to grow. and. Uh, we started uh, just adding on a little bit here, a little bit there. Now Faircloth is the supplier of lumber for CHEP, the largest pallet manufacturer in the world. That means logging, sawing, and packaging is nonstop in order to keep up with the demand. Now we've got a 100 million board feet sawmill here that we produce lumber for. And uh, all our lumber is packaged in right here on site. We do not sell lumber out on the... Uh, Lumber market is packaged for a use here to one customer, and uh, it all works out very well here. We stay very busy with steady expanding and uh, good supply of timber and resources here to do it with. Sustainability is a major priority as everything from the sawdust to the bark is used in making a variety of products. Chief among them are these wood pellets that are shipped all around the world. And with the updated machinery that runs 24-7, more than 200,000 tons are produced annually. It works really well with our sawmill here. We use all the residuals here, go directly to our pellet mill. Uh, the chips and the sawdust, we use them in the pellet industry. And the bark, we use it to dry, fire our dry kill, to dry our lumber with. And with everything that comes in here, we use it. Nothing goes out. Uh, it's all used right on our home base here. So this is truly a one-stop shop for lumber as all the products necessary to produce lumber and pellets can be found right here on site, which simplifies the process. So what we do, we got large bins that trucks uh, come under and we load them on and transport them over to the pellet mill and we unload them there. And from there, they're, they're installed in the process uh, of the pellet mill of drying it and grinding it and getting it to the right moisture content to uh, make the pellets out of it. With Georgia being the home to the most commercially farmed forest land in the country, it's an industry that has a major impact on the state's economy and employment. The amount of people that's involved is tremendous. Not only the people directly involved in the sawmill business, the pellet mill, but our loggers that we got in the woods, the truck drivers, and look at the equipment dealers. Those are tremendous amount of equipment that has to be made through other companies to supply us to keep us to making this kind of product. Reporting from Emanuel County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Well, big day at Georgia Farm Bureau recently, really big in fact. 
Governor Brian Kemp putting pen to paper as he signed numerous bills related to the ag industry, including House Bill 498, an amendment to the Constitution that allows independently qualifying family farms to enter into a partnership and be exempt from paying ad valorem taxes. Joining the governor for each signing, just about every ag leader you can imagine from the state of Georgia. I was telling the crowd out there today, we've had really three great legislative sessions now since I became governor, thankfully, thank the members of the General Assembly. I mean, we've got a great business environment here, and we got a really lot of pro-ag people in the General Assembly and in the governor's office. I, I hope that, uh, you know, it, whether it's this governor or the next one, uh, on into the future, will recognize especially the importance of ag bills and coming to the largest farm organization in the state and signing bill. This was the biggest bill signing he's had all year. And uh, I was glad to see such a good crowd of ag leaders. Meantime, in recognition of May as Mental Health Month, American Farm Bureau has now launched a comprehensive, easy to use online directory of resources for farmers, ranchers, and their families who are experiencing stress and mental health challenges. Jessica Cabrera, Farm Bureau Managing Director of Member Engagement, says the goal of the directory is to kickstart conversations about stress and mental health in rural communities. We want to encourage conversations about stress and mental health in farming and ranching communities and raise awareness that those who are struggling do not need to suffer alone. We have a motto that we are stronger together, and we really do believe that's the case with addressing these very ever-present needs that are in our communities right now. To learn more about the initiative and to find resources, log on to farmstateofmind.org. When one has a calling in life, more often than not, they find a way to make time for it. Case in point, Aaron DeRoe of Aaron's Greenhouse in Coweta County, who works a full-time job and operates a one-man greenhouse on the side. John Holcomb has more on Aaron and his small but colorful operation. Meet Aaron DeRoe a passionate horticulturalist who has been working in greenhouses since high school and really developed the trade while attending college at ABAC. Since those days, his passion for plants has just continued to grow over the years. In fact, he loves growing and taking care of plants so much, he built a greenhouse at his house years ago, and the rest is history. It was a small, eight. it was probably a 10 by 10 by 12, 10 by 15, probably the biggest. So... Once I had that built, I was just renting at the time, you know. So when I bought this house here about uh, seven years ago, I built a little small greenhouse. It was the same hoops that you're seeing now, but they were on the ground. Um, and it was a low house. Uh, it was real crowded. You had the sense that you're real crowded. The heat was kind of trapped down low. Um, and it was just a small scale. Since that humble beginning, things have certainly changed as he's made several upgrades to his greenhouse, allowing him to grow dozens of beautiful plants that customers fall in love with, which often happens when he takes them to events like the annual Cotton Picking Fair, one of his top selling locations. Locally they have the Cotton Picking Fair, which is down in Gay, and every year I like to uh, go down there and set up a booth. I've been doing that for 10 years now, um, growing flowers typically around Mother's Day. That's when I noticed I sell a lot of flowers, a lot of baskets, and I got engaged with the customers and people gave me a lot of reviews, how much they like it and how much they really thought the quality was so important to them as much as it was to me. So that's part of, that's pretty much the main point of what I do. I strive for quality in everything I do. The scale may not be as large for a quantity aspect, but I believe uh, quality always supersedes quantity in my opinion. Aaron says that he's hoping to expand the greenhouse again in the future, but says he wants to remain focused on the quality of his plants. So I'm hoping to expand and um, do a little bit bigger, but I never want to get larger than what I can take care of, you know. Um, yeah, it's just me as the only employee right now, and maybe later on down the road I can hire some help, but I never want the uh, quality to kind of lose track of that. I want to keep it small scale enough to where I can monitor that and keep the quality up and, and, and keep close relations with my customers. At the end of the day, he's just happy to be doing something he loves and is passionate about, even if it's like a second job. Nothing better than having your own name on your company and, and people just telling you how, how much they love it, you know. So it makes me happy. That's why I do it. So it's, it's not really a job for me. It's more of a passion. 
Um, being out here kind of gives me time to reflect on my day and kind of unwind. And maybe I do talk to the plants a little bit, you know, uh, get out here. And, and I like to play some music and listen to the Braves game or whatever I'm doing. Just kind of unwind and, and, and really just get, get in touch with Mother Nature, you know. I feel like with, with today's time and all that, a lot of people um, lose track of that. Reporting in Sonoy for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Crazy as it sounds, it may have been the only good thing to come from the pandemic. After the break, the return of strawberries to Washington Farms. Stay tuned. What we're doing here today and what you see in the background on this tree is uh, basically controlled mass pollination. On these trees, um, we're taking a superior mother tree, which has uh, female flowers on the tree. Most of them are in the uh, upper half of the crown, and we are isolating those female flowers with these bags to try to keep the outside pollen from contaminating what we're wanting to put in there. So what we're doing is we're taking a pollen from a superior male pollen catkins, which you can probably see on the trees back there where the pollen actually flies off of the tree. This is sort of a new technology. Most of these orchards in the past were just open pollinated, meaning that they have superior uh, families, genetic families out here but we are relying on Mother Nature just to swirl the pollen around and just be open pollinated. But with this, we can control the parents. And basically by controlling that cross um, will give us better performance, be it growth, straightness, overall form, stem form, uh, overall disease resistance. It just makes a superior seedling to be outplanted for our landowners on their property. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or any other topics as far as seedling production, seedling lifting, packing, growing, or seedling sales, you can give us a call at the Flint River Nursery at 478-508-0056. People don't appreciate you or your value until you're gone. At least that's what they say, right? Well, in the case of Washington Farms, people did indeed appreciate their strawberries. Then they went away, which at the time was supposed to be forever. Then COVID hit, and now strawberries are back at Washington Farms. As a result, an entire community is overjoyed, and the farm's owners, John and Donna Washington, are slowly realizing, wow, we had no idea just how much people loved us and our strawberries. Amazing, isn't it? How something so small and so simple can bring people so much joy. Generations of joy, actually. Even Washington Farms owner Donna Washington can't explain the comfort, and in some cases, conflict her strawberries create. There have been times we have seen arguments with people out here like, this is my bucket of berries, I set them down right here. No, 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 those are mine, I picked them. And I'm like, y'all. It's just strawberries. You can go to the store and get some more. You can go pick some more. Oh yeah, they could go to a store. But then again, those strawberries wouldn't come close to the quality and taste people have come to expect from a Washington farm strawberry. Which explains why in 2019, when John and Donna decided to end the strawberry picking for what they thought was forever, customers were stunned. And then came the pandemic which resulted in John having to make a gut-wrenching decision. Well, you know, we wanted to slow down. So last spring was the first time in 26 years that we weren't growing strawberries and could relax. I didn't worry about frost protecting or all the other things that go along with the strawberry season. So that part of it was really nice. 
But then with the COVID and all the people wanting us to bring strawberries back, uh, we were just concerned about that. But we didn't know if we'd be able to open up in the fall. And because of that, we decided to add strawberries back, which makes a lot of people happy. People are coming out here and just so glad to see them. And then my wife is just a people person. So people come out. She's hugged half the people that come out here, I think, so far this season. Hey, how are you? We missed seeing you last year and all that stuff. So there's a lot of memories that have been made out here. Did you know how much of an impact you had on this community? Didn't. We didn't. I honestly, when um, the circumstances came where we had to make that decision and John says, I'm not doing it alone. I'm not going to do two farms. It's too much work. I'm trying to slow down. This is going to be hard to just manage most of this by myself. Um, we decided to shut it down. We were not considering <laughs> the general public. We were trying to think, can we survive? Can we get our family? Can we do what we want to do with just no strawberries. Can we do it just fall? Or can, how can we cut back with strawberries? And we were trying to figure out so many things and getting advice from people. It was all about how do you shut down part of a thing that you did and juggling the numbers. Can we financially do it? It, it was final for us. We took a really good family picture out in the strawberry field with all the kids as a, as a memory of, you know, this is our last strawberry season. So for us, it was final. And then Circumstances changed, reconsidered, you know, what could we do and how could we maybe bring it back? So we could simplify by closing the Loganville farm. And with COVID, not knowing if we would have income in the fall, we had the staff to do it. And we thought, well, we'll try it again. Making memories since 1993. That's the Washington Farms motto. And maybe, just maybe, the newly built obstacle course at the edge of the property is a symbol of what the future holds in store for John and Donna. A symbol that, no matter what, this farm will overcome any and all obstacles. As far as those highly coveted strawberries, well, sounds like they're not going away anytime soon either. I told Donna, I said, you know, I just missed not having the plants out there last spring. I'm used to going out there in these beautiful plants with strawberries on them and blossoms on them. And, you know, 25 years, that's what we did. And in 20, year 26, there's no plants out in the backyard, you know, it's different. Are you at a place now where you guys could sit back, let the strawberry continue and, and let everybody else take over? He is the business thing. And until our farm manager can transition into running the business, I think he'll always, and I don't want to quit doing nothing. I, I, I say, I'm gonna quit thinking about it, so I'm telling you what I do, but I, I always want to be able to be here on a busy Saturday helping in some way that I can, because I love seeing the people. Mm. It's who we've connected with, and um, I want it to continue, and we're helpers, we, we are helpers, and so we're not gonna just leave somebody you know, stranded. We want it to be as smooth of a transition as it can be, but we would like to, yeah, uh, slow down. Donna, John, thank you so much. You guys were great. Up next, an overview of the careers available within the shelling part of the peanut industry. I'm Jamie Brown. I'm the vice president of Old Land Peanut Shelling Company. I uh, run three shelling plants, two in Georgia and one in Alabama. Today we're located right here in Smithfield, Georgia, uh, which is our head office for the Old Land Peanut Shelling Company. So at Old Land Peanut Shelling Company, what we do is we buy peanuts from farmers straight from their field into what's called a buying point. We have somewhere between 30 to 35 that we uh, facilitate during the year, spread out between Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. What we do is we bring those peanuts in, we shell them, clean them up, and then send them to people like Smuckers or Skippy, Mars, that turn around and use those peanuts to make products that we consume on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Well, we take someone with many different levels of education. We have a, a lot of people here who work in our facility who may have a GED or a high school diploma. We have some people who work here who have undergraduate degrees in everything from engineering to um, communication to uh, marketing. Then we have those who may have a higher education who look over things like quality, may have a master's in science or a master's in engineering, um, or someone like me who has a master's in business. We're continuously looking for people with multiple facets of education within our company. Um, again, we have some who have a high school education or even a GED who work out in the plant. We have a lot of people who come in who have degrees or certificates from technical trade schools such as Southwest Georgia Technical or Albany Tech who have been focused on electrical engineering or maintenance or anything along those type of lines. Um, we're continuously trying to help our employees continue with their certifications, particularly those who are working in the plant who feel like they have a uh, certification in, in mechanics but they want to have one in electrical uh, components. So we're continuously doing that and then for those who come into our plant who might be looking to get a, a undergraduate degree or maybe even a master's, we offer a tuition um, acceptance that once they're accepted into school will pay for their school um, for their education and um, for the life of how long as they go as well as they receive their degree and we'll pay them back for it. So we're continuously trying to um, take our employees and whatever they want to learn uh, continue to feed them with opportunities to do that. When people think about agriculture, the first thing they think about is sitting on a farm under the hot sun digging up you know, their crop. The fact of the matter is that agriculture has changed so drastically over the last 20 years, 20, 30 years. Um, now our company is very heavily influenced by computers. Um, our systems are becoming more mechanized, more computerized together when it comes out to the plant. So we're constantly looking for people who may go work at a computer company or could go work programming computers. We need them here because our plants and our communications are running off of them. If you're thinking about things like driving forklifts or, or working on a car, those type of things, we also need the same exact um, skill set here. Again, we have computers, we have Mecha uh, mechanical mechanisms here that have to be worked on constantly and looked at. Um, a lot of people sit back and think, well, you know, I, I want to go to the city and do marketing. Well, again, we have a product here that's marketed all around the globe. If you want to travel, if you want to see the rest of the world, selling a peanut is a pretty good way of doing it because you're going to be constantly traveling to first world countries all the way down to third world countries who need food to eat. So for us, when you have the ability to go anywhere, why not come down to southwest Georgia, come to southeast Alabama where the cost of living is very affordable, where you've got so much going on with nature, but you have the ability to see the rest of the world. You know, for me, I was pretty blessed. I kind of sometimes feel like this career found me, but the fact of the matter is I grew up on a farm. I, uh, being a farmer's grandson coming up, um, bringing in back when I was in North Carolina growing up tobacco, cotton, a little bit of peanuts, um, soybeans. I grew up around this industry. Um, and, and for my small hometown, it, it kept our hometown alive. I didn't realize until after I went to college and came back into the agricultural industry how complicated it can be for, for so many things. You know, I've traveled the world talking to people about food, about agriculture, about what we can do in southwest Georgia that can feed someone in China feed someone in India, feed someone in Europe. I've been blessed to be able to travel around this country seeing so many different manufacturers who use our products for things that make so many other people happy. Um, that's what I love about this industry. When I come home, I know that my whole community is taken care of because of the peanut, because of the cotton. I, I love that fact about it. Um, what I also love is, again, I get to travel the world talking about something that's grown right here in southwest Georgia that we take care of. Um, when I think about world outreach, when I think about technology companies and all those things, and you see all those commercials, I want to raise my hand and say, what about the little peanut that has done just as much, if not more, for the world than any iPhone or iPad? 
Jeremy, thanks so much, and thank you for making the show possible. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.